Uh, welcome to this debate for the candidates, or as some people say forum, uh, candidates for Congress. Count them, 12. All right? All right. It's a football team. Thank you. Um, uh, would the timekeeper please raise one of her time cards to, to show how everyone has to behave? Right. You don't need the one minute one. <laughs> That's right, yeah. you just need two of them today, because they, they only get a minute for everything. This is the one minute relay for Congress. <laughs> we've, uh, we've seated them in alphabetical order, and we'll start at the top of the alphabet with Susan Adams. Uh, and the first question, wait a minute, I've got to get organized here. <laughs> they go backwards. What? Start in the middle. <laughs> That's the audience. Poor Susan has to go first all the time. <laughs> I know. Let's arm wrestle instead. Yeah. But I've got. Thank I'm you. ready. <laughs> Thank you. I was born ready. I've, my checkoff list is all prepared for the way it is now. Okay. Susan, uh, what will be your top environmental legislative priority if you are elected? Um, probably the same that uh, I've taken as a top priority here, uh, clean energy. I was the deciding vote in launching the Marin Clean Energy Authority here in Marin County. In my job as a Marin County Supervisor, I want to welcome all of you to the county campus. I think our clean, uh, climate change is certainly an issue that 99.9% .9 of the people of the planet believe is occurring. And we have had a great deal of success, not only in dealing with the, the climate change issues and reducing greenhouse gases with our clean energy, but in creating jobs. We've been able to have a, a, a drop in our unemployment rate from 10.5% to 6.5%, I think in part because of the new energy jobs that are coming in to our county. And I want to continue that. It's a part of my mantra, which is the healthy planet, healthy communities approach. We've all, I've also launched some other initiatives here, polystyrene ban, the plastic bag ban, integrated pest management um, ordinance. And so I will continue to do that if you send me to Washington. All right. Next, Andy Caffrey. Hi, everybody. Well, I have a set of seven positions called New Green America because I believe we can't reform enough this country, the government, or the economy to deal with the climate crisis adequately. So number one on my list is fight the climate crisis as threat number one. I've been working on the climate issue for 30 years. I had the same professor Al Gore did, Roger Revelle. I've tried every kind of activism you can imagine, but now we're at the point where half of Greenland's ice sheet is sitting on a layer of water. We all know about the tundra problem with the methane being released. We all know that we can get down to the point where the Amazon catches on fire like it did about 30 million years ago. We're at a point where we have to do what we have to do. And so the second part of my campaign, or my New Green America proposals, is a war effort to convert, like we did in World War II, to get off fossil fuels and nuclear as fast as possible. In 1990, the EPA, IPCC, and Woods Hole Research Center all said we had to reduce our emissions 50 to 80 percent below 1990 levels by 2000. We didn't do it. We don't get any more time. So we have to do it as fast as we can. All right. Thank you for the shade for the timekeeper. Yay. <laughs> She's cool now. Uh, next, Brooke Clark. Hi. I think sustainability is the overriding issue for the environmental concerns. The climate change falls underneath sustainability. And the beauty of sustainability is that it not only affects environmental issues, but it has impacts on economy and many other things. There's a couple, there's a couple of videos that I would like to recommend for you. One is called There's No Tomorrow, and the other is called The Most Important Video You'll Ever Watch, which is an eight-part series. The idea is that if you have growth in a finite world, you have a real problem. So when anyone talks about smart growth, that's a catastrophe. Any kind of growth is a real problem. And if the economy requires growth to work, then we've got a real problem. The other important thing to know is that Democrats and Republicans agree on the big issues. That would be war, economy, health care, justice. So if you vote for a Republican or you vote for a Democrat, your vote doesn't count. 
So that's why I'm an independent. So I, I strongly urge you to vote for an independent. Thank you. <clears throat> William Courtney. Good afternoon. Uh, wish we had tents for everybody. Uh, my first move was a Clean Energy Act. Um, it, then I realized Congress is never going to do this, so it needs to be a clean energy amendment. We need to amend the Constitution because we all know that the oil industry owns Congress, and now with Citizens United, um, Kuwait uh, sheiks in the Middle East can buy another uh, congressman and keep the, the balance in a state where things will never move. If we don't stop the CO2 production, we have problems as of the Scripps who monitors CO2. As of the end of March, we're at 394 parts per million. Um, and we need to stop that uh, methane, 10, 19 times more potent than CO2. It's a third of the carbon is in the permafrost that's thawing. We have many very serious problems. Um, it will require an act almost outside of Congress in order for us to be effective in this. If we're not, not effective, then the rest of it doesn't matter. Larry Frisland. Did so, I pronounce that right? Fritzland, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, what we got right now is a mess. I think everybody agrees with that. You've heard some, some things talked about global warming, CO2 emissions, ice caps melting. Why? Why is that the case? I think that's the thing that we really need to be asking. The Democrats and the Republicans have created this, and why have they created it? The American people want a green earth. We want uh, a world that works. And so I'm going to be talking about the root cause, which is the corruption in government in both parties. And one of the things that I would, uh, if I was elected, I would propose a constitutional amendment that would say the following. Congress and the executive ban branch in all their actions will strive to recreate a biosphere like the one that existed when this country was founded. I think we can do that. I think in a generation we can take dams down, we can restore the, the soil, we, can, we have to end the carbon addiction. And um, I'm waiting for the woman to raise the flag there because I... I th I'm sure I want more in a minute. No, <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you're done. <laughs> okay, well, Michael Halliwell. I'd start by repealing the ethanol subsidy and using the money we save from that to get rid of the 4.3 cent a gallon gas tax that Lynn Wolsey saddles us with. She cast the deciding vote for that. I would raise mileage standards to reward people who are uh, driving fuel efficient cars and I would uh, cut back on the uh, general subsidies for oil that is not necessary when you're over a hundred dollars a barrel. I would in fact uh, support all of the renewables and I particularly want to hold the line against offshore oil drilling and drilling in Anwar. Not because I think it's necessarily going to cause environmental damage, but if we would leave that oil to the very last, then when the oil is even more expensive than it is now, then we'll be able to pay enough to uh, extract it safely. Jared Huffman. Hi everyone, I'm Jared Huffman, and I am going to bring an unprecedented level of uh, experience and commitment to the environment to Congress. I currently chair the Environmental Caucus of the State Legislature. I co-chair it with Senator Fran Pavley. I've been representing you here in Marin County for the last six years and also chair the Water Parks and Wildlife Committee. I've passed dozens of important environmental bills uh, in the last six years across the range of environmental issues and I'm going to continue that work in Congress whether it's fighting to protect our coast and taking on big oil to make sure we're preventing oil spills or building that clean energy economy and all of the recycling and product stewardship and habitat conservation challenges that we face for our environment. I am proud that I have been endorsed in this race by every environmental group to endorse from Sierra Club, Defenders of Wildlife, Ocean Champions, Friends of the Earth, Environment California, Humane Society, on and on. They're endorsing me because I'm going to be more than just a good environmental vote on these issues in Congress. I'm going to be an environmental leader. And I promise you that when we take up that challenge of climate change, the bill is going to have my name on it. <laughs> Stacy Lawson. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, Mother Earth couldn't be shining her glory on, a, in a, on us any more than she is today. What a beautiful day and a great reminder um, that we need to be protecting our environment at all times. Uh, I, I think it's a shame that we don't have the music going here, and I think maybe we should either sing or dance our answers. What do you say? Oh, uh, yeah, for that. <laughs> so uh, my uh, focus will be on clean energy policy. I think we need to make sure that we're actually stimulating the demand side for clean energy services, investing in the next generation smart electric grid, making sure that we have um, feed-in tariffs so that consumers can uh, be 
incented to deploy things like solar and feed in excess energy into that grid, uh, allow us to unleash the power of wind and to make sure uh, that we have a full infrastructure for plug-in electric vehicles. I also think we need to have incentives for renewable and cleaner energy development. So making sure that we're setting national renewable energy standards, uh, consumption standards, emission standards, and making sure that we have R&D tax credits that will drive the kind of innovation we need to be uh, stewarding a renewable energy future. John Lou Allen. Hi, I'm John Lou Allen. I was at the first Earth Day in 1970 in Civic Center Plaza, San Francisco, 42 years ago. Now I'm a wild seaweed harvester in Mendocino County. My, uh, I have a broad-based environmental uh, intention. I'm an independent running on fundamental reform. My first priority is ocean protection and fisheries restoration. I think with our new district that covers the entire North Coast Ocean, we've, it's either going to be industrialized or else we're going to keep it as one of the cleanest and most wonderful sources of food and recreation in the world. And I'm dedicated to that because of uh, my efforts in the Ocean Protection Coalition over the years and other people, we've stopped offshore oil drilling and now we need to change the fisheries allotments so that the hook and line fishermen can get the fish instead of the big dragnet trawlers. These are issues that I work with every day and I want you to join with me to do that. Tiffany Renee. Thank you. As Petaluma Vice Mayor, I've been working on Sonoma Clean Power for the last five plus years, since before I was elected to council. I'm one of the co-directors co of uh, the um, Regional Climate Protection Authority, where we've been working to bring Sonoma Clean Power um, to life, and it's moving forward with our Board of Supervisors. We've also been working on smart grid technology through some amazing grants, and um, I've been working very hard to protect our marsh land and our air quality in Petaluma in fighting against the Dutra asphalt plant. It's an important issue not just for Petaluma but for the country. It sets a precedent on what's allowed within our communities and we need to ensure that we have a strong EPA that will prevent things like this in the future. Additionally, I uh, co-founded the Petaluma Grange where we've been working on organic farming and sustainability, protecting our food systems from genetically modified organisms and we'll continue to do that work in D.C. Daniel Roberts. Yes, thank you. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for having us. I am the uh, endorsed, only endorsed Republican candidate in this race, endorsed by the state of California, this county, uh, Humboldt and Mendocino. And I have on the table over there, if you want to, on the way out or something, I have copies of the Constitution. I am running as a constitutional conservative, but the Tenth Amendment limit, limits the power of the federal government. It's been overlooked recently, but in terms of, uh, of environmental measures, I would like to move uh, the United States toward more use of natural gas. We have abundant supply, maybe 200 years worth. It's cleaner than, than most other, other sources. I would go also, I would support alternative energy when on balance it makes economic sense. I don't think for the, the solar and the wind that there are technologies in place. Unfortunately, for uh, job creation in those industries, yes, jobs have been created, the automotive, electric car, but they're in Finland or in China. So we have to sharpen our pencil and all that, all that kind of thing. Thank you very much. And Norman Solomon. Thank you. Uh, yes, I am Norman Solomon, and I bring to the table four decades now of environmental activism research and authorship. I co-founded, I founded actually the Institute for Public Accuracy. In 1998, we immediately began to fight for basic federal action on climate change and global warming before it was fashionable. I understand uh, that deep green has to include being willing to challenge the prerogatives of Wall Street and to fight for democracy rather than the corporate domination. Also, we've got to reprioritize our federal spending and investment on energy. And that means let's end these loan guarantees, tens of billions of dollars, for nuclear power. We don't want nuclear power, we don't need it, and we need to shut it down. Also, we should recognize that the biggest institutional polluter on the planet is the U.S. military. And as the only candidate with experience in foreign policy in this race, I'm very well positioned to raise the coalitions necessary to challenge the Pentagon's pollutathon around the planet. Thanks yeah. very much. All right. 
Is there anyone who could go to that tent and ask them to be a little bit quiet in the, uh, because I think we're competing with them in the tent. Okay, the next question, uh, Andy Caffey, you will start. Um, uh, how do you see the role of government regulation related to environmental issues? Andy? It's kind of a strange question. Um, All right. How do you see the role of government regulation related to environmental issues? Well, until now, to the present day, it's just been a way of letting corporations get away with their deeds and making them seem like they're being regulated and protecting us. Um, I mean, this is a complete failure. Look what's going on. I mean, <clears throat> well, I won't get into that now, but uh, 30 years ago, I saw someone talk about alternative energy and he thought corporations could do it and it hasn't happened. Government has not been able to deal with the climate crisis at all. The Democrats and Republicans have completely failed us. The regulations are doing nothing. The corporatists are not going to solve these problems with their regulations. We have to get a new class of people in there, community leaders, environmental leaders, people who know their science and have a background of actually saving places. I help save Headwaters Forest. I stop genetically engineered microbes from being released anywhere on the planet by organizing against Frostbend over in the East Bay in 1987 and brought down the company that did it, Advanced Genetic Sciences. Now I'm going for Monsanto. Yeah. Brooke Clark. Yeah, there's a thing called regulatory capture. You can wiki this. And there's the EPA, the FCC, the SEC, the NRC. There's a list of like a dozen regulatory agencies who were founded with the idea that they were going to regulate the industries. But today, their job is to prevent criminal prosecution of those industries. For example, the SEC's job is to prevent any criminals from going to jail for a felony. And that's true of the EPA, if you want to talk environmental stuff. They, so they've been captured. And this has to do with revolving door and what I call structural problems in Washington. All the problems that we're experiencing aren't happening like the weather from some random event. They're happening because congressmen passed laws with good intentions, but they had unintended consequences. There's a book called Freakonomics that goes into this. Actually, a number of those books. So what's happened is the things that we're suffering today are from bad laws on the books. And if we don't get those fixed, going forward is going to be very difficult. Thank you. William Courtney. Uh, while the rest of the world got together at Kyoto and um, reduced their emissions over the last 12 years by 14%, the United States has gone up by 16. We have a coal legacy that we can't afford to fix. We've got an enormous number of these plants that are too old. Um, there are new plants being put out now in Australia and China that are zero generation. Our first attempt this year is going to be at like 18%, still leaving 80% polluted. The problem with any of these methodologies is that when you put CO2, if you capture it, you've got a gas, you pump the gas on the ground, it comes back up, you asphyxiate 1,700 people. The technology is complex, and at the regulatory level, as I said, you've got an administration that's run by Halliburton, and you've got a Congress that's run by those oil interests. Uh, nothing effective is going to be done there in Congress. We need term limits to get out the corporate career person. Go there for two to four years, do your best job, let someone else come in. Um, that is, has been a mainstay of, of what I'm trying to do. And the environment will not be able to get the attention it needs until we do that. Larry Frisland. Government regulation. Today in today's uh, USA Today, uh, here's an example of government regulation. Living in a lead fallout zone, today 13 states have lead that is in the soil that is too dangerous for children to play in. This is what government regulations have done. I agree with William and Andy here that this is, this is really pretty straightforward. We just need to fix it. But why aren't we fixing it? I think the root cause is that the politicians are bought off. They go back to Washington and they, they, t they put their hand out. We all know this. They raise hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars for the endless campaigns. And there's strings attached to all of that money that they take. And so I challenge, I challenge Solomon and Huffman. Uh, to take the pledge that I have, and that is go back to Washington and agree not to take money, to be able to not be beholden or bought off by the special interest. I think that's what needs to happen, and, and neither one of them have said that because they, they need that money, and they're going to take that money, and that's what causes the problem. That's the root cause, the underlying. We can talk about biodiversity forever, but that's the root problem. Michael Hallowell. 
government regulation is essential to keep from externalized costs being dumped on the rest of us. Back in 1970, I was the Reform Coalition running mate of Peter Bear, and we were supporting all sorts of environmental re re uh, uh, protection, such as the wild rivers, such as uh, protecting the redwood forest. When the Big Green Initiative came up in 1990, I supported that along with, by the way, Diane Feinstein, also uh, Assemblyman Bill Filanti. And we've got to have a strong support for uh, protection against all sorts of environmental disasters and people cutting it too thin to try to extract the profits and leave the devil take the hindmost. I'm against the sort of leverage bailout that allowed Pacific Lumber Company to knock down a whole bunch of redwoods and cause a lot of tops on the flow off and clog up Eureka Bay and generally we uh, conservation means uh, preserving the environment we found for the next generation. Jared Huffman. Thank you. I think there's sometimes an assumption that you have to choose between uh, government regulations and the free market and the private sector. And the truth is uh, they actually need to work together uh, to make things happen successfully. A good example of that is how we've been able to lead here in California. We have set laws like the Renewable Portfolio Standard, AB 32, our California Solar Initiative, where we used a combination of some command and control regulations, some incentives, but then once we sort of create that market and that framework through policy, the private sector is taking things over the finish line. That's why we're starting to see Nissan Leafs on the, the showroom floors because California led on tailpipe emissions and on policies to require zero emission vehicles. To give you another example, I authored a bill a few years ago to create the most ambitious lighting efficiency standards in the world at the time. That's now uh, taken up in federal uh, legislation. It's the